What I tried to do is to present some uh, old work, old means a couple of years, uh, one year ago, that has already been published and some new results that we are having. Uh, and also if there is time on, on a completely different project that we have been doing that is quite weird. And so I, I'll see your reaction. So the, the, the first part of my talk will be on systems biology and uh, in particular um, on one aspect of systems biology that is called uh, reverse engineering. And uh, the, the idea of reverse engineering is to try to use um, uh, uh, multiple measurements to a, a population uh, of cells of interest or a tissue. Uh, and in particular, what we uh, try to do is to collect or perform experiments in which we perturb our biological system in different ways. Uh, when I say perturb, I mean, for example, you can uh, treat cells with a drug or you can do a genetic uh, experiment in which you overexpress the gene or knock it down uh, and so on. And then you measure the, the response of the cell to this perturbation. Now, when I say response of, uh, to the cell, uh, of course, what we would like to do in the systems biology area, at least in the reverse engineering, is to collect as much data as possible. And so up to now, the easiest and cheapest way to do that was to use uh, uh, gene expression profiles via microarray. Because microarray are quite cheap to perform uh, is about $500 each. Uh, and uh, you can have an idea of the state of the cell in response to the perturbation. Now, uh, we are trying uh, in the lab, uh, we just bought at our institute a, um, Illumina HiSec, this next generation sequencing machine. So we are trying to perform the same experiments using this type of data rather than microarray. But all my work uh, has been done doing microarrays. And then we try to use these uh, uh, experimental data to come up with uh, uh, models uh, of uh, uh, gene regulation. So for example, which are the transcription factors regulating which targets genes or protein-protein uh, interaction or also uh, influence interaction. So if a gene has something to do with another gene, although we cannot exactly understand what uh, it, it is doing. So I will show you. And then uh, one can use then this uh, gene network, as we call it, uh, to make hypotheses on a specific biological pathway of interest, and then go back to the lab and test if these hypotheses are correct or not. So it's very important here in this phase to use your biological knowledge to interpret this data and understand whether it can be useful to you or not. So this is a work we uh, published this year in 2011, and uh, this is a website where you can explore uh, the results of our work. And uh, the idea here was quite um, uh, simple. We uh, collected, uh, uh, rather than doing in-house this experiment, we collected uh, as much as experiment as we could uh, from public repositories. Uh, and in particular, we were able to collect uh, around 30,000 uh, microarrays, so gene expression profiles, for human and mouse species. And then what we tried to do is to uh, create one of these gene network for the human and one for the mouse. Uh, and so to reconstruct this uh, regulation among genes and to have a map like this where each of these uh, points here is called the node uh, is a gene and then we have a line connecting two genes if they have something to do with each other and then I will uh, elaborate a bit on, on what I mean something to do. So the idea is like that. So we perform uh, our in vivo perturbation. So we did not perform performed them, but we collected them from public databases. Uh, so we collected these gene expression profiles, and then we used a very simple um, measure an information theory that is called uh, mutual information, which is very similar to correlation. And the idea is simply that if you want to understand whether uh, two genes have something to do with each other, what you do is that you plot the level of expression of one gene against the other. Each of these points represents uh, the level of expression of gene Z in this example of one and of gene Y in one of these uh, 30,000 experiments. So if I have 30,000 experiments, I will have 30,000 points. Each point represents uh, the level of one gene and the level of the other gene in the same experiment. Now, if you look at this picture, you may see that basically you don't see a pattern between gene Z and gene Y, meaning that when gene Z is increasing, uh, going in this direction, gene Y can either be low or high. So you wouldn't say that there is something to do, um, uh, you know, these two genes don't seem to be related. Instead, in another case, so there's another example in which we have Again, uh, gene Y, but this time we compare it with gene um, 
uh, x. So it's the same experiments. Uh, and uh, you see that in this case, there is a pattern. So it seems that when gene x is increasing, gene y is decreasing and vice versa. And this kind of behavior can be measured with this mutual information that will be almost equal to zero, or let's say theoretically equal to zero in this case, and will be greater than zero in this case. So uh, what we did was to uh, use this uh, um, uh, 30,000 gene expression profile uh, and, and do all this pairwise comparison between 20,000 genes. So uh, if you do all the pairwise comparison, you have uh, something like uh, 200 million plots. So you do it with a computer, of course, and then you score your interaction with this uh, measure. And then you have something like that in which uh, for each two genes that you uh, check, uh, if there is a significant modal information, uh, you draw a line between the two genes. Now, once you have this network, you can ask uh, first, uh, what is it telling you about the biology of your uh, system? Uh, so one thing that we tried uh, to do is to show that this network can be useful in predicting the function of a gene of interest. And the idea that also is quite a classic idea is to get your gene of interest out of the network and uh, to look at all the genes that are connected to your gene of interest and then assign a function to your gene as the most significant function shared by the neighbors of this gene, if this function is there, of course. So we don't know whether uh, these genes share a, fun a similar function or not. OK, so. So this is uh, just to show you the, 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 the most significant 1,000 interaction that we recovered, to, to just to have a look at what they are. So this one is a big uh, uh, closed uh, component, so all these genes interacting with each other. And as you can see, they're, they're all the ribosomal uh, genes. So this means that all these genes either go up together or go down together in these experiments. Uh, and this makes sense because these ribosomal genes are very co-regulated, so they all regulated the same stage. Then we found other uh, things. Uh, for example, here we saw a lot of genes that were involved in the cell cycle. And we noticed that some of these genes uh, have a non-protein-protein interaction. So probably they are co-regulated at the transcriptional level in order to maintain the stoichiometry of the protein complex. And so we said, uh, can we uh, uh, identify a new protein-protein interaction among these genes since we found that they are co-regulated? And using a yeast to hybrid technique, we could validate about 50% of these interactions. Of course, this is just a, a superficial validation because it's just too hybrid, but it was just to show that this interaction may have some new biological knowledge. Um, then, uh, as I told you, another thing that we did was to validate that really we could uh, select a gene out of the network, look at its neighbors, and assign a gene function to, to the gene of interest. And so uh, we, we did that, uh, and in particular, we did that for all the 20,000 genes in our network, and then we could assign a biological function. Uh, and then once we assign a biological function to all the genes, we can do something uh, in reverse, meaning that we select a biological function of interest, and we see which are the genes that we predict to have that biological function. Uh, and in this case, we uh, were interested in lys lysosomal genes, uh, just because a lot of researchers in my institute work on these diseases, and so we chose this as an example. Uh, these are the top five genes that we predicted that to have to be involved in lysosomal function. And out of these five, only one of these was not known to have something to do with lysosomal function. This is called granulin. It's a disease gene that causes frontotemporal dementia. So it was good for me because we, you, working in TGEM, TGEM is funded by Fondazione Teleton to do research on rare genetic disorders. So it was nice that this gene is a, a disease gene. Uh, and so we, we um, uh, did in collaboration with Nicola Brunetti at our institute some exp and uh, with uh, Roman Polishuk some experiments to show that granulin could be involved in lysosomal function. Of course, again, these are just preliminary data. Uh, so what we did was uh, to treat cell with uh, sucrose, which is known to, to increase uh, 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 biogenesis of lysosome and autophagy, and we could see that uh, this gene granulin is increasing uh, when uh, at the expression level when you treat cell with sucrose. This uh, uh, catepsin D is a control of uh, lysosomal activation. Also, it was found by 
uh, and, uh, by um, a group in our institute uh, that TFEB, this transcription factor, seems to control the expression of lysosomal genes. So we all expressed the, this uh, transcription factor. Indeed, uh, the level of expression of granulin increased. Then we do the immunofluorescence assay uh, in cell overexpressing granulin, and we could see an increase in LAMP1 and LAMP2. Uh, and also, since it is known in the literature that granulin is a secreted protein, what we did was to take the medium from cell overexpressing granulin and treat naive cells that were wild type. And also in this case, uh, LAMP1 and LAMP2 increased. So uh, it seems that granulin can act as a, as a it's, it's in the, it's, uh, even when it is in the medium. And also then uh, uh, the immunofluorescence told us that uh, uh, the LAMP1 and LAMP2 signal was increasing, but this could either be due to a, an increased number of lysosomal lysosomes or an increased size of lysosome. And uh, in order to do that, we did the um, electron microscopy in which we show that um, compared to cells overexpressing GFP as negative control, cells overexpressing granulin have a, uh, uh, um, a much larger uh, lysosomes. So probably this increase in LAMP1 and LAMP2 is due to an increased size of lysosome. Now, we have not uh, uh, um, found uh, what is the function of granulin. So this was just to show that granulin has something to do with, uh, so it's an hypothesis generator, this network. Now, if you want to understand what exactly granulin is doing, uh, you have to do real uh, experimental biology. So basically here, uh, the idea, and this uh, has been published, this work uh, in 2010, so it's quite old, uh, was uh, can we use, uh, again, these gene expression profiles to understand the mode of action of a drug? Uh, what is the idea? The idea is that you have now a, a regulatory network working in the cell, so you have a transcription factor regulating expression of genes, um, the, uh, the proteins that act as uh, enzymes uh, that carry out metabolic function, transporters, whatever. When you um, treat the cells with a drug that, for example, inhibit a specific uh, protein, uh, let's say a metabolite, or in this case a transcription factor, although it's not a good example because the drugs usually do not affect transcription factor, but more kinases, what you expect is that even if your drug is not um, um, interacting with the protein that has something to do with transcription, you expect that the cell reacts, since it's all interconnected, uh, also at the, tra uh, the transcriptional level. And so looking at the transcription, you may understand something about the mode of action of the drug. So this was the idea. And uh, in order to test this idea, we used a data set that was generated by the Broad Institute at MIT, in which they treated uh, um, four different, uh, five different cell lines human cell lines, uh, mainly they are uh, uh, cancer cell lines, with uh, uh, 1,300 different compounds. So uh, for each compound was tested on multiple cell lines and sometimes also at multiple dosages and at different timings. And they measured the gene expression profiles. Uh, so they measured untreated the cells, so control and treated cells with the drug. And then they came up with uh, a ranked list of genes. So, so all the genes they measured, so 20,000 genes using this microarray platform. So at the top of the list, you have genes that are overexpressed in response to the drug. In the middle, you have genes that did not change. And at the bottom, you have genes that were downregulated in response to the drug. And so they created 7,000 different gene expression profiles for 1,300 drugs. Because I told you, for each drug, they test multiple cell lines. And so you have different lists for the same drug. So the first thing that we did, actually this was the work of Francesco Iore, another PhD student of mine, and now he's a postdoc in um, EBI in Cambridge. Um, so the idea uh, that we had was first, for the, since we have uh, for each drug, in this example drug A, multiple lists of genes that are differentially expressed, we want to create a synthetic gene expression profile that merges the different lists uh, into a unique list. Why we want to do that? Because the idea was that by merging the different lists for the same drug, you can filter out cell-specific effects that are not due to the drug treatment, but maybe they're due to stress response, etc., and keep only the, the information that is more specific to the drug. So it's like a majority voting scheme in which uh, you try to filter out uh, individual opinion and take the majority vote. So we created a synthetic profile for each of the drug, and then we created, again as we did before, a measure of how similar now the 
a transcriptional response, so synthetic transcriptional response of drug B is to the synthetic transcriptional response of drug A. To do this uh, measure that we call a distance, what we do is simply do that. We take the genes at the top of the list in drug A and see how they distribute along the list of genes in drug B, and then the genes at the bottom and see how they distribute, and vice versa. The idea is that if the two transcriptional profiles are similar, genes that are at the top in drug A, so they are mostly overexpressed in response to treatment with drug A, are also tend to be overexpressed with drug B, and vice versa. So if the distance that we come out with is equal to zero, it means that the two transcriptional profiles are exactly the same. The greater they are from, from zero, the more distant they are. So we call it a distance. So we uh, computed the distance among all the 1,300 drugs. We selected a significant threshold to say that two drugs are similar, and we came up with the network. Now we have, uh, in this case, uh, each of these points is a drug, so it's not a gene, it's a drug, and there is a line connecting two drugs if they are similar, so if they induce a similar transcriptional profile. Then uh, we applied some graph network theory that allow us to identify a group of drugs that are closely connected to each other, so they are all similar to each other, but they are less similar to the other drugs in the network. In network theory, these are, are called the communities, okay? So we got 106 communities that are color-coded. So what you see, this blot here, these are, you can see an enlargement here. So these are all drugs that are very connected to each other and they are not connected to other drugs. And then we asked, do these uh, community of drugs that we identify uh, really share a similar mode of action or therapeutic treatment? So we did that analysis and we came out with the uh, a measure that at least 50% of the community that we identified using only transcriptional profile really share a similar mode of action. For example, this community 100 is made up of antipsychotic drugs. So they have nothing to do with the transcription and, and not even on cancer cell line, but they induce the similar and specific uh, expression profile. So they are clustered together in this community. Then here, this community 63, they are all cardiac glycosides. So they have the same mode of action uh, and then use the same transcription profile. Then we have HSP19 inhibitors, uh, CDK inhibitors, and so on. So in order to test whether this uh, uh, approach could be useful, for example, to identify uh, of tar um, to identify the mode of action of a new molecule or maybe to identify uh, unknown effects of a, known, of a small molecule, because usually now, especially in cancer, drug design is made, uh, is rational drug design in which you design a molecule to inhibit a specific kinase. So you know that you are inhibiting that kinase, but you do not know what you're doing to the rest of the uh, cell. So you test a panel of 1,000 kinases and you saw that your molecule is specific, but you do not know what it's doing to the rest of the other proteins. So uh, in order to assess whether this uh, um, idea could be useful to, uh, to do that, we collaborated with Antonelli Sacchi and Herviano Medical Sciences, and what they did was to measure gene expression profile for some compounds that they were developing at Nerviano Medical Sciences. So they treated on, uh, uh, on uh, two different cell lines, um, and uh, um, some of the cell lines they test their drugs on are, were not contained in our data set, okay, so they are different cell lines. They sent us the microarrays, they didn't tell us what the drugs were, I always make the same joke, but it's true that they are in Milan and we are in Naples and they didn't want to tell us what the drugs were because they wanted to test whether the system was really working. And for example, in this example, they gave us three HSP19 inhibitors. They didn't tell us what they were and they told them they are HSP19 inhibitors. Why? Because we inserted these profiles, we transformed them into a node in the network. We calculated the distances, which are represented in this uh, graph as um, the thickness of the edge. So the thicker is the connection between two genes, the more similar they are, according to our measure. And you can see that these three drugs are very similar to this community 28, which is made up of HSP19 inhibitor. So we say your drug is an HSP19 inhibitor. And this was true also for other drugs that we test, the CDK2 inhibitors and um, uh, topisomerase inhibitors. Now there is a story behind this slide, but I, uh, I, I skip it because I want to show something else. 
Um, and then another thing that we test that was, can we, is this uh, approach useful for drug repositioning? So drug repositioning is very important for patients and for pharma companies, because it means that you have a drug that is already used in clinics for one uh, therapeutic treatment, and you want to understand whether it could be used also for alternative treatments. Viagra is the more uh, you know, famous example, but also aspirin that now is used also for uh, you know, cardio, uh, cardiac diseases. So uh, we said, can we uh, uh, use this approach um, for drug repositioning? And so what we did was, again, since we are working in an institute which is working on lysosomal storage disorder and autophagy, we asked, and this again was in collaboration with Nicola Brunetti, is there, can we identify new drugs that can induce autophagy in the cell? The idea is that uh, autophagy, since autophagy is the, is the waste remover of the cell, uh, there is a, in the literature the idea is that if you increase autophagy in neurons, you could protect from neurodegenerative disorders. Anyway, we looked in our network and at a molecule that was contained in our network, 2-D-deoxyglucose, that it is known to induce uh, starvation and autophagy in the cell. And then we asked, uh, are there other, which are the drugs that are most similar in our network to 2 d deoxyglucose? These are the top four drugs. Three of these, uh, for example, this one is an antipsychotic agent, were known to have uh, to increase autophagy. And one of these, uh, Fasodil, was not known to increase autophagy, and also it was the most similar, as you can see from the thickness. We tested it, and uh, it is a positive control, rapamycin is inducing autophagy via mTOR, and uh, um, Fasodil is inducing uh, autophagy. This is uh, LC32 immunofluorescence. LC32 is a marker of autophagy. So we could uh, show that indeed uh, this approach could be useful also uh, for autophagy, uh, for repositioning. Now the nice thing is that the Broad Institute is now going from 1,300 compounds to a million of compound. Uh, they, however, are sacrificing uh, the measurement, meaning that instead of using affymetrix marker arrays that measure 20,000 genes, now they will measure only 1,000 genes that they selected to be the most responsive according to this pilot study. And I'm hopeful that this data will be soon available if we can test our approach also on, on this reduced set. Although I'm skeptical that reducing so much the set will be so informative. Uh, okay, so this is uh, my group now. So Vincenzo did the work on um, uh, on the, um, the, the, the first part on the gene network and Francesco on the drug network and Filippo is finishing now his PhD, uh, is doing the cyber yeast uh, stuff. Uh, and, and as you can see, the, the, the group is not that big, but we have a lot of different disciplines working in and it's working quite well. So thanks a lot and sorry if I went to the time.